Welcome, everybody, to the end of September and another episode of Nudge Coach Happy Hour. Mac, how's it going? Doing well, man. We just wrapped up the Instagram, just sent it out there into the world. And it went this time? So I had to do all the typing. What'd you say? It went this time? It went this time, yeah. I'm curious if anyone else dealt with this. So last week, we did our five-minute summary you know, before we kick off the episode. And we did it twice in neither time. Oh, it's like Instagram crashed on both, both occasions. So it makes me wonder, is there floating out in the ether these, these phenomenal videos we recorded or are they just lost for good? Never know. We'll just never know. If anyone out there could either uh, slide into Max DMs, as the kids say, um, or <laughs> maybe send us an email if you're old school to podcast at nudgecoach.com and let us know if you can find that Instagram video. That would be great. From a week ago, well, who knows? But no, I think it was, so yeah. we did it twice and I thought the benefit of doing that is I felt like the second time we, we even hit more points, but it is nice when you actually can, can post it afterwards. So we just, I literally was typing up the response a minute ago and hit send. So that is now out there in the world. So that'll give anyone who's interested a good little five minute summary of what was discussed. So if you're not, make sure you're following us on Instagram, Matt Gamble, Mac underscore Gamble, Phil Bean. Do you have a space in yours? I know we talked about this. No, I'm just at Phil Bean and um, we are at Nudge Coach, which is also at Nudge Coach. That's good. So what are, what are we talking about today? It seemed like uh, I thought we had a good little Instagram live session going. It seemed like kind of focused on lifetime value today is what we're thinking. That's right. We come to Instagram and we formulate a plan. And today it's all about how to increase lifetime value of clients. So um, I started with this, I think on the Instagram live, but you know, when it all boils down to is in your business, you're trying to grow, you want to make more money. Fundamentally at a, the most basic level, two ways to do it, right? You can get more clients or you can make more money from the clients you're getting. So the second half of that is what we're focused on today, which is a great open-ended topic for two ADD guys who are going to mm. jump all over the place, but hit a lot of useful things. That's the goal. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, and as I mentioned, I literally did a post on LinkedIn about this the other day, so this is very timely. But um, yeah, I, I always revert to, because of the world we're in, thinking about, you know, there's such, such great literature in the SaaS world, software as a service for anyone that's not familiar, um, regarding kind of business metrics, business strategy. It's I feel like it's all so well documented that there's, basically a manual out there for starting a SaaS business. I feel like while you're starting to see more of that come up in the coaching space, all these different certification and training programs, what is kind of interesting though, is I feel like there's some great lessons from the SaaS world that I would like to see be carried over more frequently within the coaching space around this idea. Like we're saying, you know, lifetime value makes such a huge impact to your business in terms of the whole idea that how long a customer is sticking around. So how many times are you dinging their credit card? Um, not just, just for the basics of your revenue, but also thinking about, you know, your cash predictability, thinking about how much you can start investing in, in marketing initiatives. I mean, it, it ties to so much. And like I said, I think there's so much content out there in the SaaS world. I just, I, I feel like we're starting to see a shift, but what are your, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it, there are certain pieces of it that I would love to just sort of copy paste and explain in a way that most coaching businesses would understand. Obviously, they come from mm -hmm. um, they come from a different perspective, just in terms of you know you kind of think about coaching a lot of times, or at least starting a coaching business is a little more transactional, um, where you know put together your pro program and you want to find a way to get enough clients onto the program. Mm -hmm. It's kind of binary you know? Um, but if you take a step back and, and sort of imagine to yourself, especially if you've been up and running and you're having some success in your program, okay, right now I'm making X, you fill in the blank. Um, I'm making $1,500 off this program every time someone signs up that lasts for three months. What if for every client that I signed up, I was making $2,500? I can yeah. expect to make $2,500. What kind of difference would that make in my overall business? And this is where I wish that everyone had a Matt Gamble around to sit down with a <laughs> spreadsheet and giggle at it for a couple hours. Uh, <laughs> plug in new number. Giggle, said no giggle. one ever. <laughs> <laughs> but it makes a huge difference, you know, once you start yeah. to think yep. about it that way. And 
it's not always a completely overwhelming and complicated task to at least start to increase the average lifetime value of a, of a customer. So the amount of money you're going to collect from that customer, the whole length of the time they're a client for you. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, the one, the one thing that's relevant to every single, I think, coaching business would be you could just keep a client for longer. You don't have to create anything new in that, in that case, you find a way to keep them on longer, keep them engaged, so on. Um, but you know, the natural question after that is, okay, how do I do that? What are the different right. things to do? Um, we've talked about a bunch on, on the podcast bef before. I don't want to get too far ahead of, of myself for this conversation, but that's kind of the place to start. If I'm keeping people engaged effectively, mm -hmm. then I can extend my program and keep people around longer. That's just one way to make uh, the most obvious way to make. Yeah. And I think you do. I, I feel like we are in some cases seeing, and I've seen this in a few of our partners before, you know, yeah. in their programs may be structured that it's, it's easy for a client just to kind of, you know, stay on that same track of just tacking months onto whatever plan they're on. I think I've also seen some interesting ones that were not necessarily just, you know, well, let me first say, there's also the maintenance plan idea, which I think we, we all love because it's more of kind of a scalable membership. But there's actually another one I wanted to touch on too that I have seen before where they basically have different chapters in the client journey that they've kind of planned for of saying, hey, look, yeah, my typical plan may be, you know, say it's three months or six months, whatever it may be. But after that, they have a secondary program that is defined. It's maybe six months. It's kind of stage two of the relationship. It's maybe a little bit more um, hands-on than a traditional maintenance plan that we may see that's super scalable, heavily relying on you know, scalable content like webinars and digital content. But I, I think we're starting to see some interesting perspectives and interesting strategies come up which I do think is a benefit of, of times like these. I think you're starting to see some new innovation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it makes sense. You know, what I probably would have opened with if this were normal times, um, not COVID where every, everybody seems to be in mm -hmm. dire need of finding a way to monetize something online. Yeah. If this is relevant to a in-person coaching business, if, I mean, I'm working in person with clients, yeah. I absolutely come up with new ways to extend the relationship or create upsell opportunities, downsell opportunities, or, you know, continuity programs, stuff like that. And that gives me more money to invest in renting out space for in-person workshops even. Now, mm -hmm. I guess nowadays we should probably focus more on the online thing anyway. Um, but because of that, you know, there's, there's so much that you can do. I don't mm -hmm. want to sort of overwhelm people. Um, but you know, the, the most important thing to do is sort of pick one and start. If, you, yeah. if you're kind of do, getting, yeah, do something. I think yeah. <laughs> if, if I was going to stand on top of my house right now and say like one sentence, it's do something because I think, and this is just me from being in the SaaS world for so long is I think once you're used to the whole idea of recurring revenue, going, go, getting away from it or seeing other models that don't have recurring revenue is just baffling to me. Like I, I can't wrap my head around the idea of I'm just going to allow a traditional kind of transactional relationship in which I give someone something, they just give me money one time that mm -hmm. I, I think it's, especially this day and age, I think there's just so many ways to be providing ongoing value to people. And I think people want it. I, I really do think people want, and they're willing to pay for it and I think coming kind of back full circle to some of the things we've talked about regarding kind of like funnel structure before and on kind of the sales and marketing side is there's always going to be a percentage of people willing to take that next step. And I think in this case, it's those willing to continue to invest. And so if you do have some kind of follow-up program or a membership, I think those are two really good places to start. Um, what would you say in terms of you're looking at those two, which one do you think you want to, do you want to unpack one of those first or are there, is there one, you're the, you're the group coaching guy. We established them in the Instagram live. I don't know if one of these better resonates with you than another. <laughs> well, uh, I will say, unfortunately, all of them resonate with me. So let me, I, I do want to reset on one, one item. Um, one of the kind of unconventional and potentially overlooked pieces that actually is one of the most important to the longevity of a relationship is nailing the onboarding process. I know if you listen to it, it's a lot, we hit it a lot, but um, really investing time in onboarding and welcome messaging and having, you know, some FaceTime with people on the front end, uh, really kind of investing there 
creates kind of a trust surplus or it's kind of like sweat equity in a relationship where you've kind of built up this extra trust. Um, so you have kind of a buffer as, as people ease into the program, they're not as anxious because you've really committed to them up front. Um, that's one of the best things you can do first, first of all, to, um, to make sure people are sticking around for the duration and potentially ready to continue on. So I just wanted to bring it back to that first. When I come back around, I mean, I, I just, I, I love the continuity offer. The maintenance program is, is mm -hmm. so simple and underutilized to me because it's what I don't like suggesting that people do is something that's technic technically complex, um, especially if they're just getting into a phase where they're ready to scale in their business. Mm -hmm. um, and so what I like about a maintenance program is that it can, can potentially be developed in a way where you have kind of the same set of topic-based content. They could be running for a year round, 12 months, like month one or January every year you're focused on this. February every year you're focused on this and so on. And so whenever people move on to that maintenance program, you could be just cycling them in at the right time to focus on, on the right things. And so the idea that everyone's going through the same stuff at the same time makes it much easier for you to implement than say something where, you know, someone signs up on day one and the flow starts from there to where every single person in that program is at a different point. That's a little complicated to, to manage and administer and create. Yeah. I, um, so, yeah. I, I agree with that. I think there's some, if you're running everything in a cohort style, I think it is a little bit easier because to your point, the maintenance plans can even kind of follow a similar cohort uh, structure. But I think you, you touched on one thing too, that I do want to circle back on with, with respect to onboarding, because I think it ties into the, the longevity piece is we, and this is just experience we've seen from the nudge world is we have absolutely seen a correlation in the amount we can humanize an experience on the front end in the length of time a person is willing to engage. So when, and what I mean by that is imagine if you were just going to send somebody a text or imagine I was just going to send you a text message and you didn't know who I was, mm -hmm. how likely are you to respond to that message? Not very likely. And so I think what we see is yeah the importance of really building that connection on the front end. And I think within that onboarding structure and that, that conversation, you know, it's a great time to be, um, you know, making sure you can kind of navigate it around any friction points or pitfalls. You can set expectations, but also too, and this ties into all of this is make sure the person is really well prepared and set up on the different platforms and tools you're using. Because if you put, if you invest the time on the front end of that piece, once you have them on the systems, whether you're using something like a nudge for, for the coaching side, or you even you get them comfortable with like maybe webinars on zoom or whatever it is that once you have them on there, you can just keep the, engaging them through that same mechanism and, and method. And I think that's where I always tell people invest as much as you can on the front end. Cause it's going to pay you dividends on the back end. Yeah. And coaches, uh, and I don't want to speak out of turn for every coach out there, but a hell of a lot of the coaches I know are incredibly good at sort of teaching habitual stuff and routine and focusing on that. Mm -hmm. So that's what it becomes after you teach them how to get on in the first place of a, of a new system, something like nudge. Oh, I'm on it. I understand how this works. Now it's in your wheelhouse of saying, okay, now we're in the routine of, of checking back, keeping each other accountable along this road. Um, that's why it's just so important, especially I think in the coaching world um, and probably is in, in other industries as well, but especially in coaching, I think that gets coaches running programs online into a comfort zone faster because they get to focus on the things they're really, really good at from that point on. Yeah, that's a good point. That's absolutely a good point. And I mean, I, I think if we really wanted to go full circle on this, I think this is also where, um, you know, we've talked about kind of the influencer model before that I, I think as you do this in a maintenance plan, I think caters well into this is you're, you're thinking about scalable content. And I think um, things like webinars, podcasts, I think things like that weave really well into kind of content for maintenance plans, things that are, you know, you can be addressing Q and A at scale. You can be providing insight at scale. Um, I think all this just ties together. And I think as a result, it kind of further helps you build your brand. So it, I think it really is this cycle of creating great content, eventually getting it to a point that it can be scalable because I think it's going to fuel your business on multiple sides. Absolutely. And yeah, I think, so bring it back to, I guess, 
we've talked about onboarding and welcome messaging there, um, those communications. We've talked about kind of a transition to a continuity plan or maintenance plan of some kind. Mm -hmm. um, there's also the piece if, if you're sort of planning for this phase of your business, I think. I would take a step back and think about a, a messaging sequence of some kind that's specifically focused on re-engaging people who seem to be disengaging throughout the course of your program um, and strategies that you can implement for that. Mm -hmm. uh, just consider that as kind of one of those pivotal points. I think um, when it comes to trying to add longevity to the, to the relationship and increase lifetime value. You've got sort of all these key transition points that you want to have kind of workflows or specific plans for mm -hmm. how you're going to communicate and you want to kind of test them out and be able to iterate on them. You have the onboarding welcome piece. Um, you have the, this potential, these people seem to be disengaging. So I'm going to have a plan for something I'm going to reach out to them with when they start to do that. Maybe it's an email workflow that you already have built out, but you're ready for that situation so that you have a plan in place. Mm -hmm. um, and you also have the end of program. Okay. I need to have something in place to transition these people to so that I can keep them a paying client for longer. Um, especially if you're, you know, starting with a kind of intensive program, the continuity offer that something like a maintenance program ought to be a pretty easy sell. I mean, so just, let's just go to health and fitness, for example, say I'm a weight loss coach. I run this intensive program goes really well. I mean, the messaging is sort of built into the fact that everybody knows that 80% of people who lose weight gain it back and often even more. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's right there for you, you know, Hey, this has been a great experience for both of us. Loved working with you. Um, I just really want to make sure that we see these results stick. How about this? I have this simple accountability program. You can stick with me for as long as you want. Um, it's monthly. You can start this month, um, or pay up front for the year. That'd be great if you could <laughs> do that. Right. Yep. Um, but it's just going to be X amount. Would you, would you be interested in continuing so I can make sure you kind of keep the results that you Yeah. Get? Keep them tethered, keep them tethered to the, to you and your brand. Yeah. And so it's these little transition points on the journey that you can build systems around that yeah. become scalable and you can really, really hone them in over time. Um, I think that's what gets really interesting as you start to put them in place. If you think about them as these pivot points and, and systems sequences that you can build in that you can iterate on over time and see how they're doing, mm -hmm. then, you know, you're going up and up from there, getting better and better. Yeah, actually, it'd be worth touching on too. And you mentioned systems and, and automation. I think there's probably a couple of things to touch on with that. It'd probably be helpful to think through a little bit some of the systems, like common systems we're seeing people use for things like this. Because I think there's, you know, when you're going down this path, what you don't want to do with a maintenance plan or subsequent programming is you don't want to set yourself up for um, making this an, it, some kind of crazy time drain on yourself. And I think it's really, really tough and you really got to balance great value at scale. And so yep. you can't be doing these one-on-one -on -one sessions. You really have to think about, and I, I just, from my two cents where I see some of our, I think seen partners do it previously has been something like, okay, maybe monthly they're going to do a webinar and maybe they're also giving this, their maintenance group access to some kind of ongoing evergreen content library that they're pumping content out in terms of their blogs or something like that. Or maybe they have access to a private podcast channel or something. And I think what they'll try to do is if they're doing something like a webinar, have everyone in that maintenance plan on that way, they're able to address kind of Q and A and engage people more at scale through kind of the, the webinar chat they're not doing any one-to-one -one communication really at that point, or if they're doing limited, maybe it's asynchronous, maybe they're just doing it through like one-to-one -one messaging through something like a nudge or any kind of like coaching platform, but there's no longer one-to-one -one coaching sessions. It's all largely yep. asynchronous if it's personal, but if there's any type of synchronous event, like, like a webinar, that's all at scale. And I think that's things like Zoom, Webinar Jam, those types of platforms. I think using things like learning management systems are helpful. I mean, you could even just use a Facebook group. I think we've seen people do that before. Um, Absolutely. So, I mean, what else are you seeing from your end? Yeah, I mean, those are, those are probably the best examples of where to capture people. Um, in the business world, we could see opening up a Slack channel to people. Yeah. Um, you know, that's 
these things you want to fit to the audience you're sort of dealing with, right? So if it's a, a community of kind of social folks who are just kind of, you know, say stay at home dads or something, um, the Facebook group might be a, gr a great place to wrangle those people. Um, but if it's, you know, you're doing kind of leadership coaching and everybody's mm -hmm. on Slack in their companies already, you might as well have something like a Slack channel to keep everyone uh, engaged. You want to meet them where they are. Um, when it comes to the, the systems for pushing out workflows, like we were talking about at these kind of key transition points, you know, you can never, never say enough about, you know, the value of email. You have an email list. You, you could it. run the whole thing through email. Yeah. Maybe <laughs> there's a newsletter you funnel all these people into and you're just pumping out some kind of really, you know, based on some kind of cadence, some kind of regular email. Yep, absolutely. And, and, you know, the great thing about, about that is, you know, if you're, if you're regularly sending out things through like email, something that's, that's easily trackable, measurable in terms of opens and, and clicks, you can have sort of built into the process as you get more and more comfortable with um, setting up email workflows, things like, okay, if someone hasn't opened one of these in, in 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, start that re-engagement sequence and yeah, have your, have your seven day re-engagement sequence planned out where, you know, you want to make that the re-engagement sequence feel more like a personal outreach, even though it's already built into the, to the system. But what you're mm -hmm. doing there is kind of acknowledging with that person that, Hey, life gets in the way. I get it. You know, there's yeah. a lot going on. Is this still something that's valuable to you? I really want to see you get these goals. If you stay on the road, I think you will, or you can drop off, you know, that's, that's your road. You're kind of creating this fork in the road for them to say, Oh yeah, that's why I'm doing this. Let me, re-engage here. Yeah. Yeah. And because, um, I mean, yeah. you touched on this, the reason we, we do these is, well, for one, yeah, it's great if you can keep a person just paying you. But I think too, as you outlined, most people are going to need you again at some point in time. And it's going to be a lot easier to get them, you know, back into a program if they're already kind of half still working with you in a way and still consuming your content and engage with your brand in further building more and more trust versus if they've kind of gone out on their own and maybe, you know, you lose touch. So it, it, just like you'd see in marketing, I think it's very common, very similar um, concepts. Absolutely. So I guess one thing, the one thing I can think of off the top of my head that we haven't thought about for this, for this grander topic is just the sort of obvious of upsells of different things that you yeah, can offer. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. So I don't know if we want to beat that up much. It's, it's fairly obvious if you have other things. So there are a lot of common examples in, in health coaching businesses, especially that we can think mm -hmm. of. I don't know if you want to touch on anything that you've seen. Yeah. Well, it kind of just kind of touches on what I was just mentioning is if you get someone to say they wrap up a program. So say they've been in a three or six month program, you then kind of transition them and say, Hey, do you want to um, for X number of dollars a month or say it's, 29 or something like that, something in low cost. Hey, you can stay in this maintenance plan group. You get access to these podcasts, these webinars, whatever it is. Um, maybe it's to your point within that um, kind of construct, you're also providing some content and touch points through email sequencing. So it's much like you would do if you just had someone on your email list. And I think that's where what you can be doing is if you do have other types of programs, that is the audience you want to be further nurturing and trying to drive them to make those subsequent purchases or to upsells mm -hmm. to your point. So you're kind of going from core programming downgrade to maintenance plan upgrade into kind of program two. they'll probably downgrade back into maintenance plan. And then you're kind of going through that natural progression of in and out of your primary programming, but no one's ever gone. And I think that's yeah. the main thing is kind of thinking about that maintenance plan almost as like a safety net that you're, you're never allowing a person to, to leave you completely. You're just downgrading them to a plan that makes the most sense for them at that point in their life. Yeah. If someone's having a good experience with you, if the experience is meeting their expectations, mm -hmm. there's no reason to ever let them go away. Um, just always have somewhere for them to go where they're yeah. still in the relationship with you. So. I mean, think about, we, I mean, I think of, we have a lot of partners that'll even do, um, fairly inexpensive digital content too. I mean, so maybe it's even a la carte, it's $10 cooking PDFs. I mean, so there's, I think there's things you can do that are as you grow and, and uh, you know, we touched on this, you know, in multiple episodes regarding don't try to get into the too scalable stuff too quickly. Cause I think it can be a distraction and it completely take you sideways. But when you're ready for it, 
I think you really can have a substantial amount of kind of digital content that accompanies this that can be great points to help further nurture and have these touch points with people provide value. And yeah, they can be generating more revenue for you as well. But um, I just think you can kind of continue to put these kind of breadcrumbs throughout that always lead back into your programming. Yep. That's absolutely right. And that's, so that's sort of, we've gotten, I think we did a good job there. We started kind of simple and went into the advanced course Yeah, yeah, that's um, good there at the end. So I'm actually impressed with us. How, how do you feel? I think this was actually, I could be crazy here. I feel like this was a better, I think this is one of the better episodes. This was like maybe a top three. I don't know if everyone's noticed yet, but you can just go ahead and count on our shtick being that we self-congratulate at the end of every episode. <laughs> it's, I think it's, it's really our uncertainty. It's always weird when you're recording stuff like this. I think this is where I wanted, I want to be better on Instagram of like, as we're doing this, of like trying to get people to engage of like, Hey, what things in trying to make this as like real time as possible of getting good feedback as we're going through it and touching on other topics and having follow-up questions. Cause I think, at the end of the day, we obviously want this to be helpful. And you, the, this is everything we talk about are based on things that come up in our calls throughout the week. So this is really as real time as it kind of gets for us in terms of, hey, what happened? Um, but yeah, no, I think this is, you know, I think from here, though, there's some interesting follow up. I think there's some kind of complimentary topics and follow up episodes we can do. So I'll just be curious as we kind of, especially with kind of evolution of our system with where it's going, I think it's going to be easier to see some of these kind of programs kind of get launched be more in the weeds with our partners on it so i think we're going to have more to talk about with them and hopefully have better ideas and different concepts to to share with people yeah i think yeah i think we can project the road into more specifics of diving into program launches program automation uh complementary communication along the road of of those those kind of more automated touch points and programs all this stuff is going to fit together and we are not so subtly te teasing some significant updates to our platform. Um, so if anyone makes it to minute, whatever this is of this episode, feel free to ask us about that. Cause there's some big stuff coming. Yeah. I won't tell you exactly what it is, but I'll tell you <laughs> if you're on the webinar uh, week after next, I think. Yeah. Isn't it like, yeah, I was going to say week after next. That's right. Yeah. I had a heart attack for a second because I thought it was next week. I was like, oh, God. <laughs> that would have been bad. Well, I guess we would have just promoted very quickly. at the beginning. Very quick promotion. No, that's good. <laughs> Awesome, man. Well, I think, yeah, I think that's it. I think that was the week. Um, so, you know, cheers to you and we'll have to see what next week brings. All right, guys. Another episode of Nudge Coach Happy Hour in the books again on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and our YouTube channel, which is the Nudge Coach YouTube channel. Don't forget that. Um, but appreciate everybody. And we will talk to you again next week.